So welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this very welcome session on art, desire, and techno-entanglements with all the effective complexity and seductive appeal and intellectual challenge that such entanglements, harmonious, abrasive, and other can bring. My name's Judith Buchanan. I was for many years um, director of the Humanities Research Center at the University of York in the UK, where I am now, despite the entertainingly intense skepticism on this very subject by the security officer at the airport, uh, now Arts and Humanities Faculty Dean. Uh, I don't know what a faculty dean looks like, but evidently not like this. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and our respondent for today's session. Each will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity at the end as well for, us to, for um, a response, a formal response, and we will then open it to the floor for questions. So our first speaker's work covers a dizzying array of creative uh, forms of expression from web-based and time-based media to sculpture and installation, performance, drawing, and text-based forms. Renato Ferre's, Ferro's work has been exhib exhibited in galleries and performance spaces of distinction around the world, most recently in Singapore, New York City, and London. On the Faculty of the Art Department at Cornell, Renee's creative critical and critical creative work asks questions about the cultural traction emerging technologies uh, can bring in both nimble and extremely trenchant ways. Recent publications include work in Media N, Uncertain Practices on Sightly Aesthetics, and Erasure, The Spectre of Cultural Memory. She takes as her title today, From the Pleasure Principle to the Technological Drive. Please welcome Renato Ferro. Test, test. I just have to yell. <laughs> okay. right, and we're on there? Okay, super. So many thanks to Deb Johnny and to all of you for um, inviting me to share my work. Um, what you're going to hear is basically an artist talk. Um, I'm going to share with you three projects, one that's a little bit older, uh, 2007, 2008. Um, a project that I've been doing that's kind of ongoing that I started um, a little bit later than that, and then a brand new project that I've just begun, but I have no idea what I'm doing about, and it's basically, I'm going to share with you an entry from my diary. So it's idea, idea-based. So here we go. Techno entanglements. As a conceptual artist who works within the creative skins of old and, new, uh, old and new media, many of my projects are framed by concepts of memory's erasure. From the listserv I curate, Empire Soft Skin Space, video installations. Is that sound OK? It is? OK, it's grating on my nerves a little bit. But uh, Empire Soft Skin Space, video installations such as Fort Da. I'm going to share with that. Uh, with that. Uh, this project with you today, Panic Hits Home, and Suspicious Packages, and the web-based project, Private Secrets, Public Lies, I have been influenced by the interrelationships between technology, culture, and art. As an avid user of technology and a professor of digital technology and culture, I find myself consistently negotiating back and forth between the streams of knowledge generated by a critical international new media practice an unsustainable, overzealous consumer economy, and the innovative and independent freewheeling hacker community. <laughs> Much of my work mobilizes creative interactivity, incorporating issues related to human psychological and sociological conditions. The challenge for me as an artist is to critically redefine technologies and their intents in relationship to their use and misuse. By aligning artistic practice with critical approaches, my work takes on creative skins whose configurations involve creative editing, coding, projection, and installation techniques, where I comp composite juxtapositions that incite new visions. 
These hybridities, whether in the gallery, the museum space, or posted on the internet, challenge original meanings by oftentimes incorporating strategies of humor or irony to deep stabilize intent. These skins can include uh, time-based, participatory, collaborative, generative, and customizable characteristics impacting the network quality and the development of my ideas. From the pleasure principle to the technological drive. In 2004, just a handful of students in my um, studio class would have had digital cell phones. That seems remarkable in 2018, when the data phone seems to be ubiquitous. Staying in touch, I always hold on to mine. Staying in touch via voice oops, or touch screen, where notifications are oftentimes signaled by dings, bings, and rings, have us toggle to our digital phones and that network, our voice, email, news, music, entertainment, exercise, meditation, shopping, whatever we might have to toggle, um, needs to gather into one device. So Fort Da from the Pleasure Principle to the Technological Drive is a video installation that was begun in 2010-ish, inspired by these emerging technologies. Historically, the video has three versions that kind of evolved over time. One was exhibited in, in Pesh, Hungary, one at the Freud Museum in London, and finally one at the Cornell um, University's Johnson Art Museum, and it kind of evolved um, in interesting ways. Borrowing from Freud's writing, my premise suggests that the use of contemporary technological gadgetry screens Freud's hypothesis of Fort Da. Can it be that our identification and obsession with gadgetry and the repetition of its daily use is a manifestation of our own deeply repressed anxiety about the presence and absence of our network group and loved ones, and you can tell there's a little bit of play there, a little bit of um, satire, maybe, for some of you, maybe not. How long would you estimate, and I always ask this, actually, when I, but I'm not going to of you, but I always say, how many of you, how, how long do you spend on your phones, right? How many, and I see many of you are already on your phones, <laughs> which is good, it's not a bad thing. Or email, or your viral network, networking systems. Where do you keep your phone? You know, I keep mine, like, right here, right on me, I'm with it. Um, um, when was the last time you lost your phone? Is there anxiety when you lose your phone? Is there panic? Amanda? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I, I witness this all the time. Um, if you're anything like I am, um, you feel somewhat panicked, uh, a sense of loss, uh, a sense of disconnection, um, for a whole, a whole host of reasons. While we consistently try to rid ourselves of the ubiquity of technology, we also cannot live without it. I think within the last two years, these notions have shifted again interestingly, and I know for me, I've been trying to put limits on my technology. Like I'll say, okay, after eight o'clock, I'm not gonna respond to my email. And then at nine o'clock, I get a, a little note from the registrar, and of course, you know, I wanna email back. So, you know, even though we're trying to put limits on it, I know for me, I, I'm not so successful at that. As we retrieve technology, we are, not managing, are we not managing our virtual presence? Like the separation and anxiety we continue to feel in relation to our mothers, our tools, and networks of communication function similarly to the wood, child's wooden toy? Freud contended that the symbolism of Fort Da represents the child's identification of the object of the spool as a symbol for psychological events, most specifically the child's anxiety over the disappearance of the mother. Freud theorized that by controlling the actual presence and absence of a play toy, the child managed the virtual presence of his mother. The Fort Da game was the child's mise-en-scene for symbolism, the use of one object, a wooden stick, to represent the absent object, the mother. And um, I'm gonna show you uh, the video right now, but I just wanted to thank, uh, in 2009 I actually um, enabled my, a group of uh, students um, to help me with this, to consider Fort Da and what it meant for them. And um, we actually used Beyond the Pleasure Principle as a prompt um, to inspire recording uh, video recording sequences. Um, and we write on a little bit of creative interpretation, stretching our imagination to consider technology broadly, um, where other material objects latched onto, or we latched onto, to rehearse the anxiety and pleasure of Fort Da. And I'm really thankful for them for entertaining my craziness. Um, so I'm going to play for you Fort Da. Interesting. 
listened when his parents Oops. asked something of him. We gotta start. At the but above all, there we go. We're testing sound. There we go. The child named Ernst was a little over a year and a half and could manage a few comprehensible words. He also could express a number of sounds that proved meaningful to those around him. He was often praised as a good boy, for he rarely woke his parents in the middle of the night, listened when his parents asked something of him, but above all never cried when his mother left him. This wonderful child had a wooden toy with a piece of string attached to it. What he did was hold the toy by the string, toss it down, and then hailed its reappearance. This then was the complete game, disappearance and return, here, there. This was all repeated untiringly as a game in itself. There was no doubt that the greater pleasure was upon the reappearance. He was greatly attached to his mother, though both of his parents took turns tending his needs. Little Ernst had an occasional habit of taking any small object he could get hold of and then throw it away from him. Finding the toy once again gave him great satisfaction. He often gave vent to a loud, drawn-out O, oh, which his mother agreed corresponded to the toy being here. When the toy was gone, his mother often heard him hail the reappearance with the joyful there. The interpretation of this game has become obvious to me. By himself staging the disappearance and return of objects, it staged itself as a rehearsal for the separation anxiety and eventual pleasurable return of his affections. In this way, through play, the child manages separation anxiety through repetition and manipulation of the tangible object, here and there. It is obvious that their play is dominated by the wish to be grown up and to do what grown up people do. It is clear that in their play, children repeat everything that has made a great impression on them in real life and that in doing so, they abreact the strength of the impression and, as one might put it, make themselves a master of the situation. Differing theories of children's play have attempted to discover the motives which lead children to play, but they fail to bring into the foreground of the economic motive. That is the consideration of how much pleasure is involved. At an art museum recently, I observed a young mother surrounded by her four children. The infant nestled in an infant carrier suckled intermittently at the mother's breast as the mother led the rest all under the age of five through the exhibit for a lesson. What struck me most during my observations was that as the family moved in tandem through the cavernous exhibition maze, the children moved back and forth within rather close proximity to their mother's body sometimes connected actually by her outstretched hand, or at other times by what appeared to be a virtual thread that toggled between them and their mother's medial. Strikingly, as one child yo-yoed out away from the forward path of the mother, the next child seemed to recoil in closer to the body, only to offset the wayward child's momentum. The mother's voice and the lesson's content seemed to rhythmically reinforce the back-and-forth momentum of this moving rhizomatic cluster. The force of their trajectory moves them to the gallery salon containing the 1975 video of Yvonne Rayner's performance, Trio A. By chance, I notice a mirroring of the elastic traces of Rayner's gestures as they ebb and flow around a centrifugal, non-fixed point in her performance space. The mother stops abruptly, directly in front of Yvonne Rayner. She pulls out her data cell phone of the pocket that is oppositely situated from the suckling infant. She texts. One of the children drops to the mother's feet resting. The others quietly hover in a holding pattern. The mother disengages her attention via the virtual network of her cell phone technology, pulling in the there to here, here to there. Of great interest at hand is the contradiction that is set before us between the repetition compulsion and the pleasure principle. The technological play and imitation carried out by adults 
in particular in using technological gadgets, does not spare the most painful experiences, yet ironically can be felt by them as highly enjoyable. We work, we acquire, we play, we toss. This rhythm of life combines with the negations of rupture in a post-human world. Here to there, our economic system reifies the existence and dominance of gratification and its primitive tendencies rooted in children's play. So you probably recognize that a lot of uh, some of the narrative is I'm, I'm uh, appropriating from Freud's uh, Freud's own text. Others that is my own writing, and I actually just for your, uh, reference, I started actually with the narrative, you know, with a script, and then all of the images were basically found images that I'm just compositing together to form this kind of simulated um, kind of piece. Um, okay, I'm just gonna pick up again. Okay. Um, let's see, how much time do I have? Oh, good. All right. I'm just going to kind of briefly just wrap this, this project up and move on to the next. So in the video, the colliding frames of Fort Da forge Freud's theories of the pleasure principle with the technological drive of contemporary digital life. We amplify our lives in the comforts of commodi commodities, technological gadgets, toggling them to our bodies in what um, often appears, obviously, a post-human world. In my composited video and installation, wholeness is simply a theoretical construct, like Lev Manovich's notion of compositing as an end to create a virtual space, the colliding frames of Fort Dodd video, the borders between the different worlds of psychoanalytic and the world of technology, and the digital culture and ju um, are juxtaposed where varying elements of vision and meaning are merged. Do we want to flip on the lights? I don't think we're going to need, yeah. yeah. I can see. While compositing uh, proposes a virtually seamless space, Lev Manovich writes, borders between different worlds do not have to be erased. Different spaces do not have to be matched in perspective, scale, lighting, individual layers, although my gaming colleagues would definitely, you know, take issue with that. Propose that these shifts create gaps or spaces where the viewer can enter to consider their own potentiality with changing psychologies and technologies. In a special issue of Canadian journal Parachute 13, I don't know if you guys know that one, it's, it was one of my favorites, devoted entirely to the omnipresence of the screen, theorists collectively celebrated the human body as it is amplified with technology through developments in wireless and miniaturization. Quote, in this everywhere augmented and constantly monitored reality, the screen functions both as a skin and as a reassuring umbilical cord, constantly connecting us with other people. So this next uh, project, um, I'm going to call it Concealment uh, and Revelation. So uh, Fort Dodd negotiated or interrogated the relationship between the private and the public, uh, the interrelationship between individual uh, privacy, secrecy, and concealment on one hand, and the forthright tendency for revelation on the other were key contradictions in the work of life and Freud, uh, in the work and life of Freud. Dealing with privacy of secrets or concealment and surveillance is an installation and game called Private Secrets, Public Lies, which you can actually access online. You have to be, it's with Java, which is uh, a rather relatively old processing tool, and you actually have to be on uh, Safari and you have to make sure you have the most current version of Java. But once you get in, I guarantee you it'd be very interesting. Um, so I'm going to just play this and um, try to play it. Yes, okay. Um, within the installation, uh, let's see. Uh, within the installation, a secret spot provided a platform for me to experiment with a single performative act of writing a secret. Generous and lively contributors wrote public recollections and then shredded the content for inclusion in a sculptural piece that became a receptacle for the archive of personal secrets, and that was the slide before. I conceptually translated the analog gesture of writing, actual cutting, and displacing text through online website and game interface using the open source software code called Processing. The online game allows remote users to enter personal secrets or text-based information. 
The coded algorithm within processing parses and distorts the text into an archive of anonymous collective keywords devoid of their original intent. And just as a secret, I will tell you that I just used uh, nouns, verbs, and adjectives to kind of parse things out to make it easier. I have to say I was just learning the, the, the program processing, and so this was actually a manifestation of that. The text data gets recycled into the World Wide Web, reminding us that contemporary technology has substituted the private performative gest gesture of communication through the unreliable and uncontrollable network. Most interesting to me is how easily private and public information become entangled in the digital age. And that's just a little gap on the, um, and I'm gonna just move ahead. So basically what it does is it just goes into feed, random feeds that happen to be different than perhaps the day that they were plugged in. And here are just a couple of installation shots. That's the box at the Johnson Art Museum. Um, this is actually, um, this is when I first kind of hatched the project up in, um, uh, I don't remember where that was. Do, uh, I don't remember where it was. Um, there's another, and this is the main site. And over here there's a news feed that kind of archives all of the searches that ever been done and ever been entered into the program. So my last piece, and I'm gonna wrap it up here. Another research interest is my fascination with the cadence, pitch, and dynamic quality of the narrative voice. It was in 2013, approximately five months um, after my da daughter was diagnosed with acute uh, promylocytic leukemia that I wrote this narrative that inspires an animated drawing and sound piece that I ca will call remote sensing. This initial animation will eventually be part of a larger sculptural installation. So not so playful of a, you know, of a, a start, but um, a way that I'm kind of, I think, interestingly going to use the material. And I'm going to just play, and this is kind of just a, a diary entry. We live on opposite coasts, east and west. The condition of APL leukemia is a malignancy of the bone marrow. Physically, I can hop on a plane and be at her bedside in about nine hours, and of course, that was imperative during the early weeks of her diagnosis. The condition is measured by the intricacy of blood counts. While the highly trained oncology nurses administer her chemotherapy cocktails and play Whoops, what happened? Oh, I know. Let's see, try it again. We live on opposite coasts, east and west. The condition of APL leukemia is a malignancy of the bone marrow. Physically, I can hop on a plane and be at her bedside in about nine hours, and of course, that was imperative during the early weeks of her diagnosis. The condition is measured by the intricacy of blood counts. While the highly trained oncology nurses administer her chemotherapy cocktails and plasma treatments, the interrelated numbers and data reveal the path to recovery. The temporary surgical port accepts her life-sustaining blood products and chemotherapy that is directly connected to a large medical infusion pump that sits alongside of her bed. The ambulatory pump delivers her treatments in programmatic preset amounts. This cyborgian collapse between human and machine is capable of changing biostates, while simultaneously visual displays and sonic alarms allow the careful monitoring of her biosystem. While the infusion pump pushes this life-sustaining biomaterial through the series of tangled tubes, our networked phone system allows us to be virtually toggled to one another as virtual umbilical cords when I return to the East Coast for work. As the diagnostic blood counts propel body fluids, the virtual umbilical cord delivers anecdotes of her recovery. It was the remote sensing of her voice that became most important in judging her recovery trajectory, the dynamic qualities of her voice or its pitch, the speed in which she spoke, what was unsaid, or how long we spoke become more of an indication of the strength she was gaining. 
So Donna Haraway, in her seminal 1984 essay, A Cyborg Manifesto, writes about the blurred boundaries between machine and organism. While Haraway proposed fictional scenarios, she also acknowledged the potentiality of modern medicine's abilities to merge organism and machine. She wrote, by the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we are all chim uh, chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are cyborgs. The cyborg is our ontology. It gives us our politics. The cyborg is a condensed image of both imagination and material reality. The two joined centers structuring any possibility of historical transformation. Cyborgs are not reverent. They do not remember the cosmos. They are wary of holism, but needy for connection. Thank you very much. Uh, so he's director of EcoSono, a not-for-profit that's working for um, environmental sustainability by making, and I quote, non-conformist music in dialogue with nature. And I think that resonant phrase, in dialogue with, is one we will uh, surely come back to. Born into a fishing family in Alaska, I think it would be fair to say that Matthew Burtner knows his ice and is... <laughs> perhaps particularly well-placed to observe its acoustic behaviors, moods, and tonalities, with both the formal expertise of a composer and musicologist, and also the intuitive sympathy of, as we might say in the UK, a lad from Alaska. Yesterday evening, we had the privilege of seeing and hearing some of the wonderful creative purpose to which he has put those sympathetic, active, and collaborative acts of listening in Ice Cycle, his mesmeric co-production with dancer and dance choreographer Jody Sperling. In the interest of not leeching time, are you set up? Yes, good. Uh, in the interest of not leeching time from Matthew himself, I commend his bio entry in the program itself to you for more on, um, on eco-acoustics and also on some of Matthew's fine awards. But he takes as his title today, Sonic Physiographies of a Time Stretched Glacier. Matthew, welcome. Uh, no, I guess I have this. Thank you. I think this is on. I'm just going to start by um, listening to uh, Sonic Physiography of a Time Stretch Glacier. <laughs>
Well, that's how it begins. Uh, sonic physiography of a time stretch glacier starts from the principle that glaciers move too quickly. Um, in spite of the axiom of glacial movement as a temporal expression of extremely protracted time, they are retreating far too rapidly. Uh, I grew up in the presence of these giant earth animals and their extinction is truly a great cataclysm of our time. Uh, indeed, we learn monthly about new records of ice loss. Uh, two days ago, Nature released an article um, describing how the Antarctic ice shelf has accelerated melt threefold over the last five years. Um, the Arctic ice has similarly reached new records of loss, particularly since the 1990s. The 10 lowest levels of ice in the Arctic since we began tracking the data with satellites in 1979 occurred since 2007. Um, and although only 1.7% of the world's water is trapped in ice, glacial ice accounts for 68.7% of the total fresh water on the planet. So glaciers figure in the public imagination as distant, slow-moving, and globally unimportant. But this is a misunderstanding. They actually affect people worldwide by providing fresh water, water for hydroelectric generation and agriculture. Um, glaciers also break down into icebergs that influence uh, global shipping. And the glaciers store climate records that uh, reliably um, help scientists understand the atmosphere a million years ago or more. Ultimately, the, the melting glaciers influence sea level rise as well, and this affects over a billion people on the planet. So 1.7% may seem like a small amount of water, but in fact, if we were to melt all the ice on the planet, um, it would raise sea levels by over 200 feet. And we've experienced a few inches of sea level rise, about eight inches over the last decades, um, and that extra water wreaks havoc on coastal communities already. So imagine for a moment if um, sea level rise of over 200 feet. In, um, in her book, Do Glaciers Listen? Julie Kreutzschank exploits ethnographies of indigenous knowledge in parallel to scientific understanding that emerged in the mid-1800s as immigrants applied European notions of nature to glaciology in, uh, in the north and the west. Um, in contrast with the local population's understanding that glaciers were sentient, social, and animate, and responsive to humans. So for example, in the Yukon, glaciers provided travel routes that enabled human connections between the coast and the interior. And the people who traveled these routes described the glaciers as reacting to the behavior of the people who, who passed. Um, they would listen and pay attention, um, and they would respond to the behavior, uh, especially to indiscretion. So for example, one should never cook with grease in the presence of a glacier. Um, the elders expressed dismay that uh, that at the idea of campers and hikers uh, frying bacon. And so the idea was that the glaciers listening for the sound of bacon frying and knows that, that someone is passing without the, without the proper um, local knowledge. So this is kind of the context in which these sonic physiographies of a time stretch glacier Again, um, and the method, I'm going to talk a little about the method for this piece and some of the work that we're doing with ecoacoustics here at the University of Virginia. Um, ecoacoustics is, I think, a fitting uh, subject for this talk is that it's an entanglement of art and environment through data. Um, we start with a mediation of nature and the application of experimental scientific procedures for artistic ends rather than for purely scientific ends. The data allows the artist to collaborate with the environment uh, as a musical instrument. And so the instruments of ecoacoustics 
include the wind, the river, or the glacier, composed in counterpoint, perhaps with traditional instruments such as the violin, the vibraphone, or the harp. Um, the methodological approach resembles science, but the output is music. And this music may, in turn, become a new dimension of scientific inquiry. Um, Ecoacoustics, in particular, explores that, that methodology that interplays between science and art. Um, I think I break it down in the, in the method into three components. Um, field recording, which is sensing the vibrational energy of the world. Sonification, which takes the data that the scientists gather um, or the through the field research and maps that into sound. And then live interaction with natural materials. And this is a very important dimension of it that provides the human nature interaction that explores how we uh, interact with nature in an Anthropocene. Um, these three things work in parallel, like in the piece that you, that you heard last night, Ice Cycle. Um, in this work, the, the physiographies start with an approach that I call sound casting. And um, this is a Matanuska Glacier in South Central Alaska. And um, it begins by, <laughs> we begin by um, miking the glacier. Uh, in a number of ways. So deploying an array of microphones across the, the surface of the glacier, um, putting them inside the glacier, under the water, at the, at the foot of the glacier, into the crevices, um, and really collecting a large scale uh, resonance of this dynamic system. You can't hear these things with your ears when you're on the glacier. In, in totality, you can hear one little bit of the, of the, the glacier melting, but by deploying dozens of microphones and then bringing that back into the studio, you can actually understand the dynamics of, of the glacier as a, 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 as a, um, a, a system. So here's one mic on the glacier, and um, it sounds like this. hear the intricacy of the rhythms and the pitches already present in this small instance of ice melting. This thing is already a musical instrument. But that's just one point. That's what you hear at that, at that specific point on the glacier. All this, this intricacy. Um, if you combine the microphones, so this is 19 channels of glacial melt, so what I would call a sound cast of Matanuska Glacier. Um, we, it sounds like this. this sound to study the, the animation of the glacier um, through the spectrographic analysis of the image here that shows what we're hearing um, underwater, uh, the resonant frequencies of the glacier, the inner ice deformation, and then the surface water, which is incredibly rich uh, and multifaceted on its own. So in, in expanding this physiography, this sound cast, we, um, we start there, and then in time-stretched glacier, so in order to slow down the, the glacial melt, we actually begin time-stretching this sound to open up the inner dynamics of the, of the system. So here again is the original. <laughs> this is how the piece begins. So what we heard at the beginning was uh, uh, 
the percussionist playing the bell and then this this sound. And here it is time stretched two times. As we slow down the glacier, we start hearing those inner rhythms amplified and we could start um, spending more time with the with the with the dynamics four to eight times so this this example moves from four times stretched to eight times stretched. Listen how, in addition to hearing the rhythms and how expanded across time, we're also starting to hear a kind of resonance of the glacier emerging in that. I don't know if you could hear that, but there's a kind of pitch information that starts emerging from the time stretching. Just going to play the rest of that sample. So if we amplify the resonance, we can bring out that pitch characteristic within the, the, the larger sound field. original glacier sound already and we start now recognizing the music that we listened to at the beginning of the talk then we can take the noise away out we take remove the noise and we're left with just the resonance of the time stretched glacier <laughs> So this is the, the basic method that creates the piece. It's then coupled with a percussionist who's playing vibraphone and um, playing from a score that's generated, composed out of the resonance of the time stretch glacier. And so the piece then sounds like this. <laughs> The software that plays along with the percussionist creates the human nature interaction. So the, the time stretching of the glacier is accomplished by the input from the percussionist that drives the, the, the process of, um, of time stretching. So the, the human performer is set into an interactive real-time relationship with the glacier and in particular with its melt. And so it's kind of imagining music like stopped time, like a photo inside, like these photos inside the glacier. And there's another musical example, which is probably very similar to the last one. <laughs> That's um, a kind of look into the methodology of sonic physiographies of the time stretch glacier. This uh, work that we're doing with ecoacoustics experimental research at UVA <laughs> has been quite productive. Um, this is one example of it, but the, but the method allows different researchers, different artists to um, explore different systems of human nature interaction. And so we've, we've 
taken uh, trips to various parts of the world and around our state to um, do this field re recording and to interact with the environment. Last, um, this year, we presented several uh, student eco-acoustic research projects in, uh, in Brisbane at uh, the Griffith University. Um, some of these projects include things like studying wild honeybee populations in um, the, e the U.S. East Coast, atrazine in the soil, um, Shenandoah Park caverns and erosion, <laughs> landfills and waste management in Virginia, and urban sprawl in Virginia. So these methods can interact quite productively with issues that are important to regions and um, or globally. Um, I'm really proud of the ecoacoustic students this summer who have been working for the last several weeks in an intensive program, meeting every day for half the day, and we've been traveling around the state um, working on a number of projects. So. Um, they're, they're here, and this is the last class, so <laughs> great job, <laughs> you all. <laughs> Alice uh, Claire has been studying oil spill, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline impact, and she's doing um, using oil spill sonifications, bark, bass drum, leaf shaker, guitar, and voice. Uh, Elena Kim has written the K-Ocean, K K K um, studying the effects of heat on the ocean, um, and she's using hydrophone recordings, plastic acoustic sonifications of ocean heat, and violin played with natural materials. Um, Eamon Kahn studied, created the Ragged Mountain Reservoir Sound Walk for horn and natural sounds. And um, Madison Carton works, is working on disruptions in nature, human mediation of natural soundscape for processed bird song, natural materials, percussion, and Caterpillar, <laughs> interestingly. <laughs> um, so here, we just performed last week down at, uh, in Blacksburg at the, at the Virginia Tech for the New Interfaces for Musical Expression conference. And here's a picture of us playing um, on stage there for the, for the NIME, at the NIME conference. And then we performed a show last week here in Charlottesville, a uh, collective response show at the Haven, playing this same piece. Um, this work used uh, bamboo, ecoacoustics of bamboo, which is an invasive um, plant, and, and so we're exploring the performance of that. So great job, you guys. And that is all I have for this talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Could I ask our creative critical artists perhaps to come and um, sit at the table before I invite our formal respondent to um, take to the lectern. So, Renee and Matthew, would you like to come and join me at the table as I introduce our respondent? Thank you. Do you want to sit? So Anjali Prabhu has kindly agreed to be our respondent today. Okay. Anjali is um, director of the Susie Newhouse Centre and uh, um, on the faculty in the French department at Wellesley um, College. She works on post-colonial African studies, cinema and cultural studies and has a, a current project on the go about the Indian ruler Tipu Sultan. Anjali, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Judith, for that. And thank you, Biljani, for the invitation. And I don't know if Ian is here. Um, wherever he is, thank you for your leadership and uh, for creating such a buzz around the humanities that is uh, resonating well beyond UVA. <coughs> so, and thanks to the presenters who, neither of you that I got to meet, but I have loved uh, listening and, and watching and um, learning from you. Sorry, can you hear? <laughs> now you can. <laughs> Well, what I said before wasn't as important because now I'm getting to the meat of it. Um, if there's a lesson to be learned from Heidegger's essay that, um, of course, Ashil raised yesterday uh, on the question of technology, it is that examining the words that we use to understand something can allow us to question our very understanding of it. And what distinguishes modern technology from the older forms of technology, tools, 
uh, older agriculture, even bridges, if you know that essay uh, of Heidegger's, is that in these new forms, uh, we find a challenge that goes out to the resources of the earth, not just to be extracted, but to be stored, distributed, and used elsewhere. In both presentations, and as we saw in what Ashil said yesterday, essential to European thought, indeed the history of ideas, is the, the, the notion that people are not things. And the overlap and the reversibility, as Ashil said, of this, so the overlap between things and people and the reversibility that people are not things is a source of deep anxiety. And as he reminded us, technologies of the future contain the anxieties and biases of the past. I think our two, uh, the works of uh, our two artists actually bring to the fore uh, uh, this opposition between people and things and whether that can be sustained and why we want to sustain it. Uh, I was thinking especially of your um, uh, idea of the glaciers uh, being sort of um, witnesses uh, to our ethics. Um, so what is most useful, or perhaps elementary then from Heidegger, is that technology is not a what, but it is a how. It is a way of sensing and acting. Technology is, is I'm sorry, um, I have no idea what I wrote, but it is a form of revealing, so I'd rather not look at what I wrote. Uh, it, it is, it's related to the skills, not just of the craftsman, but also in the traditional meaning of uh, the skills of the poet, something that both presentations illustrated so well. Our artists today are thinkers whose art theorizes and illustrates what Heidegger attempts to do, which is moving us away from an apocalyptic aspect of technology, technology as revealing. And that revealing is most often linked to ordering or mastering an environment, controlling demand and supply. But technology as revealing can also conceal another type of revealing, which is more primal. And that's exactly what our artists are getting at. It can tell us about distance as we saw. A technology can be used to measure distance and to ascertain what, what a particular distance is, but it, in, it can obscure another understanding of distance, something that becomes completely altered when it's experienced or known through desire or friendship. And we saw that with uh, Renata. With Matthew, we saw how exploring the way technology allows for our rupture of the idea of chronology, spatiality, and it provides an understanding that is equally experiential through his artistic compositions that are painstaking in not just you know, the way that they are ordered, but also in the way they are collected, in the way that uh, uh, he gathers them and learns about how they are generated. Um, and I should say in the way that they are organized through you know, not just the, the, the use of technology to, to, to curate it, but also through sheer genius that puts them together. So technology as instrumentalization takes us away from the meanings that our artists have illustrated, and framing through the poet is a revealing as much as it is a way of being. What both artists do is to show us that the essence of technology is not technological. That is Heidegger's statement that is somewhat incomprehensible, but when viewed through the work of these two artists, we really understand that the essence of technolo technology is absolutely not technological. Um, our understanding of ourselves through technology and through their use of technology takes us to another meaning of our essence that is our being in the world, which is to be thrown into the world. The word in German is geworfen, right? To be, to be is to be thrown into the world. And that, I think, is really what you guys uh, illustrate and explore, uh, that the, is the essence of, hu of humanness is not 
navel gazing, but really our relationship, the way we stand in relationship to the world and to our presence in it. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali, and thank you to both of our speakers. I think Renee's um, reflective um, pieces on how we process and navigate our own relationship to the world and how those can be mediated in order to uh, prompt and enrich our own reflections on those uh, navigations were, were very quietly touching. And, um, and Matthew's drawing attention to the way in which the temporality of the adjective glacial has been enacting, sadly enacting, its own inversion as the actuality of the glacier has been uh, learning a process of acceleration that we wish it wouldn't. Um, again, takes us into the, the secret life of the glacier and then finds ways of amplifying and collaborating with that in order to bring it into our own cultural space for reflection and action as well. Um, thank you all very much. The floor is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Where would you like to start? Um, could uh, be um, Joe and Neil will be uh, bringing microphones to you. Thank you, Joe and Neil. And th if you could wait until the microphone reaches you and then also just announce your name and your affiliation before you ask your question, that would be great. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much for those talks. My name is Jessa Lingle from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, my question is for Matthew. Um, I was so moved by that presentation and I was like emailing all the sound artists I know and I was like, this is so great. Um, I was thinking about, I study countercultural groups and I worry a lot about the politics of visibility and the way that visibility can be a problem, right? Like I'm exposing the secrets of a group of people who might want to keep that hidden as interesting as I and other people may or may not find them. And I was wondering about the politics of listening. Um, so far, I see it as like a p potential for political m movement, right? So a way of like forcing us to be attentive to global change that we just haven't been in the past. Um, but I was also thinking of like, um, Ann Carson has this work on like metaphysical silence and the moments where not listening, where something is silent in order not to be interpreted. And so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about when the limits of listening come into projects like yours and your students. Um, right, that's really interesting. The, um, so we're, we sort of start with, we start with kind of undoing the ocular centric approach that dominates most of our learning and, and, our, and our methods and we try to recenter on listening and um, that opens up a certain set of relationships with the, with the world that are sometimes surprising. Um, for example, uh, a more kind of um, holistic way of understanding the environment around you because of the omnidirectionality of, of hearing. Um, in in comparison to the to the frontal view of of, of our of our optics, um, and then and then also the the way that our brain connects with that hearing, so that we relate to the things that we hear differently than we do, with maybe less of a kind of um, consumer driven or consumptive approach to more of a kind of emotional response. So. That's already a big step. So to then kind of discover where where listening fails or, or where it where it meets you know the the where it meets silence and real really silence that is the things that you don't hear um, is you know is a is a challenge. We um, one of the things that we discover very quickly is the most powerful forces in our environment um, we don't hear like light you know or temperature. Um, that we're rather, you know, we just can't hear those those changes. There's these different methods, but we can sonify them, and so and that's an interesting kind of step to say. Well, we can't hear that, but let's hear it. Let's actually use the methods and the and the the tools that we have to turn light into sound. So, for example, like shifting light in the afternoon through the leaves, we could listen to that, and and because we could then hear it, we might have a different relationship to the shifting light in the afternoon and the leaves. 
you know, that that's sort of an, another way of understanding. So in some ways, I guess um, it, nothing is silent in that <laughs> respect, you know. But there's a larger there's a larger question there about the secrets of things that shouldn't maybe be uncovered, and and that's something, you know, that I think about a lot with endangered, um, you know, ice and and uh, and well, yeah, just different endangered environments in this in this time. Should we be drawing attention to the beauty of those spaces and and discovering them, um, at the risk of uh, creating a path for, you know, a more path for others to follow and then disrupt it further. So there is that, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going, in order to keep, um, what would you like to do? <laughs> ah, no, I'm all right. Uh, are, are we just blind, are we just lighted out are we blasted with no definition to us would you like us to have no definition it's fine no we're fine thank you thank you very much in the interest of balance i'm going to invite us to oscillate questions so that we we bounce between our two speakers um therefore i would now like to invite a question for renee thank you uh, just just wait for the microphone to reach you here it comes yeah th um th these were both fantastic um, presentations. And um, I was uh, wondering about the extent to which you're focused on objects and the, the, the fact that you do frequently, I guess be by the nature of your work, you focus on that object um, aspect of technology um, as opposed to the systemic relation to technology and uh, um, to what extent is your work um, dealing with that uh, with that quandary about technology that we're kind of uh, that we access it through objects, but it's not an object or it's a, an, a, a somewhat ungraspable object? So, as an artist, I'm not going to give you answers. In other words, what I'm trying to do is open up the question, um, and and I guess from my own point of view. Um, Yes, I'm using, um, you know, a lot of the objects that I'm using and sometimes poking fun at are technological. Mm -hmm. But I think my, um, a lot of my work has to do with the narration or the bringing together, the juxtaposing of, you know, possible ideas that may reflect upon those objects or those technologies. And I, I have to say, I, I, um, I look at technology, even though I used in those particular examples, you know, you know, cell phones or whatever. Y you know, I feel that, you know, even the fabric that the uh, choreographers mm. used last night w w was a technology. Mm. The way it was wrapped around their body and was reflected uh, from and then also, um, you know, unwound was a technology. You know, we all carry pencils and pens. I mean, we've been dealing with technology for, you know, thousands of years. And so I just don't find this, we've always been, tools have always been centric to our lives. I mean, it's just the nature of things. And so, you know, as an artist, I like to kind of, um, you know, I teach digital media, I teach digital technology, and I kind of like to reflect, especially for my students, um, to be somewhat critical in their use of their, the tools that they're using every day, but also to reflect on that through their work. And sometimes it's yes with, with digital technology, but other times it's other materials. We're artists, right? Um, but I have to say also that in relationship to the last question, what I wanted to say is for me, sound is just as important. Mm. It's the words and how we're talking about them, not only about the content, but as I said in my last piece, Remote Sensing, it's about you know cadence or pitch or, th or what's not said, right? It's, it's, it's the pause, it's, mm. the, it's the, and so, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, I'm, as an artist, I'm not quite sure if I would agree with you that I'm just that um, technologically centric and that I'm ignoring the systemic. Um, mm. I don't think I am, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take a question for Matthew now, over here on the aisle, please. Uh, Thank you, those were wonderful presentations. Lori Lefkowitz from Northeastern University. Um, 
the music is is beautiful and heartbreaking and um you know still in the uh i guess li with this morning's talk reverberating um early in your discussion you describe the glacier as a kind of animal mm. which i think resonates and judith you talked about the secret life of the glacier so i was wondering the extent to which our knowledge of the loss of glacier and the fear and regret inspired by that knowledge motivates us to animate the thing so we we feel it as a living organism because we're sorry for it and we're afraid of what will happen and so I guess it's a kind of epistemological question if if our knowledge is creating this response that then becomes our response to the music and makes it feel heartbreaking. Uh -huh. Well, I, I would say that definitely the, the we instrumentalize the the things that we care about. You know, we're we're and and in, in art that's certainly the case. I, I just recently presented some of this research at the American Geophysics R Union conference, which is a big science conference and um, and they were asking about this idea of glaciers as instruments, and you know, well, do you write, you know, do you write for violins too? And I and I answered that, you know, well, I I given the choice now about writing for a violin and writing for a glacier, <laughs> I, I'm probably going to choose the glacier because this is a, <laughs> you know, this is a we can connect to this instrument, um, in a way, and we we understand the the unfolding. Um, dynamics and the emotional uh we have a, a, a emotional framework for that now with loss and um and change and that that's in some ways more poignant and and exciting to to express with than um a violin which has a different kind of context now nothing wrong with violins i was sort of picking on them but you know that was the the point was rather to 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 think of the think of the systems of the environment as instruments and equally, and so I think that that is kind of where the the question is. So, but whether it's composing for them or listening to them, it's just not apparent that we might be able to listen to the atmosphere um, as an instrument. That may not be. We may not I imagine that we can do that, and so the 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 artist can create that <coughs> that possibility, and then it becomes part of the the world of, of, of instruments. So just before we take the next question, I'm going to sneak one in in, in quick follow-up to that. So that y uh, Matthew, you said that I if given the choice, you would now prefer to write for a glacier than yeah. for yeah. a violin. But of course, in, the, in a, a, a brutal, literal way, you're not writing for a glacier, you're writing yeah. from a glacier. Right. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I guess and the in its most unpoetic terms, and that this is not how we see or experience it, and it's clearly not how you are living and experiencing it. You are going to a glacier, you are capturing a, s a soundscape from the glacier, and then you are composing something that is working with those sounds that yeah. has become your composition. But that the ev all the ways in which you frame it yeah. are refusing that s sequentiality, and are it's all about with, in dialogue with, yeah. but actually this is a collaboration where right. collaboration means working with, right. and that there is something responsive, n responsive and dynamic and also dictating about the offering of the harmonics or the found percussion section or whatever it is from the glacier yeah. that enables a, a two-way <laughs> kind of reciprocal process. So yeah. the poeticism of that process is felt in how you frame it as well as how we then experience right, it. Right, right. Yeah, we think of, um, I mean, that's a little bit of the limitations of the field that I'm coming from. So we think of writing for instruments. But in fact, we're always writing with instruments because they they have properties, limitations, boundaries that are exciting and, and create opportunities. So we're, we're always really writing with. So the violin also is with, and the glacier is also with. You're totally right about that. It's a, it's a kind of a failure of the language of the, of the field <laughs> in some ways. But, um, but definitely, um, it's, it's a function of human nature interaction. So in the same way that we can't actually write, uh, let's see, we can't actually present the glacier as a musical piece because we affect the glacier. We, we're playing it. We are 
changing it, mm -hmm. not necessarily by um, one person. I mean, if we leave no trace, you know, if we if we interact with the glacier in a way that doesn't change it in that moment, we're still changing it, all of us, um, through those kind of those patterns of behavior amplified across billions of, of people. So we are playing the glacier, we're changing it. And um, and that's a function of the Anthropocene that we that we that we just we do that. So so in some ways the piece itself, the creative engagement between the human imagination and the and the environmental system is a human nature interaction and a um, an expression of that relationship, whether or not we would want it to be. But I think that's a really interesting point about the the instruments um, that we compose with, yeah. uh, whether they're human made instruments or, or environmentally um, environmental instruments. So. Thank you very much. Um, Jim Chandler. What you're with, it's here. Thank you. Um, since we've been talking about the unconscious all morning, I wanted to ask you both about um, whether the notion of an auditory unconscious um, gets any resonance for you. Um, and um, I mean, it, it's all over Renata's talk in a way, although not explicitly. And with yours, Matthew, I was thinking that um, you spoke of the way you get at this, what we're calling the secret life of the glacier as taking a photograph. So mm. yeah. Walter Benjamin famously theorized this notion of an optical unconscious around the question of photography, um, showing us things that we hadn't understood were there. I, is that a way that you think about what you're doing uh, or, or no? And Renata, if you've got something to say about that. I, I think it's an interesting, <laughs> potentially interesting, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I never would, um, Assumed to be a Freud specialist, so I don't know, you know, I'm, you know, I just I would defer to my Freudian, um, the Freudian scholars in the room. But it sounds like a really fascinating potential for, um, you know, for some possible, you know, creative work actually. Um, and I'm wondering if you know my remote sensing piece, you know, might be a yeah. really interesting way yeah. to kind of, mm. you know, I mean, there's so much, you know, it's really taken me. It, it's been five years since I wrote that piece. It's been taking me a long time to just kind of realize that it, it might be interesting for some kind of creative intervention. Putting that one together with the Fort Da. Yeah, maybe, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe moving away from the Fort Da, actually. Yeah. And moving away from the tools. Because th the Fort Da was done probably over five years ago. Yeah. But m to, to, to think about that whole notion of sensing. Um, and I don't know, yeah, I th it's interesting. Is that an operative notion for you, Matthew? Well, so... I mean, m music can't really ever escape time, right? It's just set in time, so we can we can try to slow things down, and we could imagine that we're composing for a photograph as a pho as if we're taking a photograph. But the reality is, we can't. But I I did take these these images inside the glacier, so I was lowering the the microphones down and and looking at them, and I thought, well, this is just it's just gorgeous. What if I put the camera lens like right up to the ice and took a picture inside this? And these images were so fascinating, and so they were happening in parallel uh, as I was doing this research, and um, and in some way they were inspiring this idea of you know, we could fix the melt, so the water on the surface of the ice becomes again frozen through the image, and could the music also somehow become frozen? So could we go inside a drop of water and 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 just live in that world for for a while and in some ways the time stretch glacier is kind of attempting to do that um, while also recognizing that it just can't <laughs> it can't do it so. and what kind of disclosure happens in that refreezing yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. Well, so maybe the answer lies in um, you know the juxtaposition of you know the beauty absolute beauty and lusciousness of the sound and the images but then the absolute terror of what's really happening which is the destruction of our environment. Mm. Or perhaps in my pieces, you know, that really interesting, playful Fort Da, <laughs> you know, playing with the string, and then, you know, the opposite of that, which is, you know, the potential of losing a child, really? Or mm. perhaps, you know, something else. So in other words, both ends of the spectrum. 
you know, that, that what's in between. We have time for one more. Second off the aisle here. Thank you, Neil. No, no, here. Second off the aisle. Thank you. Hi, this is, I'm Sherry Parks from Maryland Institute College of Art. And this is between the two and related to yours. Um, I'm really interested, the aesthetic experience involves emotion. And I'm particularly interested in empathy. So this may be not for or from, but with. Um, I live near Ellicott City that's been flooding for the last couple of years. You've seen those. Yeah. Um, and it was very interesting to watch. It's partially a, a rural waterway, partially an urban waterway. Um, but I was really interested in listening how the river became vilified. In, in, uh, it's a beautiful river. It's not the river's fault. It's the asphalt's fault. Um, mm. But I wonder how you think about how emotion changes the orientation and in this case the water is moving very quickly and and how the aesthetic of quietude works in your work because it's very easy to empathize or even sympathize with mm -hmm. a child but not so much <coughs> excuse me <coughs> mm -hmm. the river when it it is swift water mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um right that's right because i, I you know i'm thinking about I just gave a talk like this in Houston um, and after the, the flood, after the, the hurricane, and it was, um, everyone was very raw about these, these issues. I mean, this, this was not, you know, you had to almost be really careful about what you said about, about sea level rise and, and flooding. I mean, it was, people had been displaced. They'd lost their homes. They, you know, it was a, it was a serious matter, and it's affecting their, um, their lives dramatically right now so this was where the the a situation where the 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 ice melting the oceans rising the hurricane these are um well they're they're destroying people's lives so they're they're vilified as you're as you're saying and you know i think um we might look to you know people have lived alongside riverbanks for forever and been you know, I'm also reminded of a story of the, the where I was born in Alaska in the southwest. Um, the Quijack River connects maybe ten different community, different people, different languages, and it m the water moves from the glacier to the ocean. And that river became um, a symbol of the interconnectedness of peoples and the environment and the people. It was their livelihood as much as it was um, you know, the, the salmon move up the river, and as much as it was the um, the source of uh, of devastation when it would flood and and um, break up and things or take people's lives through the boats or sweep them off the shores. So it's this, you know, it it, it is a our interaction with nature is um, is fraught with all the characteristics of life. I don't really, yeah. It's it's a really interesting. Well, it imposes an intentionality. Yeah, uh, I think in a way that the, the um, isn't there. Empathizing with with things like water is really fascinating to me, and I'm actually working on another project. Um, we live Ithaca Cornell University is on the the very bottom of of Cuga Lake, which um, holds these amazing not only stories but myths and all kinds of. And I've been thinking about what it would be like to empathize with a lake or empathize with, you know, and to kind of have it reveal um, all of the layers of history and all the layers of complications that, that, it, that it holds, you know, in the middle of a state that's rural, but it's rural, there's poverty, there's all kinds of, like, social issues. And, and um, so the notion of empathizing with a body of water or a situation I think is – you know, really kind of fascinating. In fact, I'd like to collaborate with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea of the empathy of the creative project per se is a really nice place for us to start to wrap this up. I think from the from the searingly autobiographical to that lovely mapping of um, comings and goings around a family unit in the museum, which is both kind of complementary and, and competitive in their engagements with their mother, through to the it feels almost like an ekphrastic project of finding both organically related but also analogic ways of thinking about our engagements with the natural world. I think we've had an absolute bundle of treats, um, so please join with me.
in thanking our speaker.